We are speaking with uh, the one and only Mark Cantor. Those of you who are Guns N' Roses fan know him very well from all his work over the years. His new visual podcast, The First 50 Gigs, uh, is coming up very shortly, actually, by the end of this uh, month. As we say uh, in Montreal, uh, bonjour, Mark. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? <laughs> good. So uh, I, I'm thrilled for this. Now, I was just, 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 and I told you before, I was just texting with Alan Niven. He, he sends his, uh, he sends his hellos from Arizona. Um, before we get started on, on the first 50 gigs, how important was Alan in, in getting you this access or was this before the Alan days? Well, no, this was before the Alan days. I, I mean, I, I grew up with Slash since 1976, basically. So, um, you know, Alan came around when Guns N' Roses, a couple of different people tried to manage them and, and nobody would take on that task or the band wasn't happy with whoever was trying to take on that task. But Alan seemed to be the one that was, you know, was wearing the pants and, and he was boss and, and he got in there and kind of, you know, uh, you know, they needed a little rattling around to, to straighten that out. And, and, you know, he got them, he was able to get them to the next level. He, he was, or as I like to say to Alan, he was the one that was crazy enough to deal with them. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that, that, was, <laughs> right. that, was right. lot, that was a, that was actually a chapter in the, in this whole story that was a little wild right after they got signed. You know, they wanted to go in and, 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 and start recording these songs that they had put together, which were all great songs. And you know, you hear them all on Appetite for Destruction. There were no throwaways, but uh, Tom Zutat, who signed them, still thought that uh, they needed maybe one more song before they're ready to, you know, go in the studio. And you know, it just that was a dark time. And in those four or five months, you know, anything could have happened. They could have died. They could have got. When I think they could have, could have died on their own. They could have gotten killed. They could have gone to jail. They could have broke up. And most likely would have been dropped from the record company or all of the above, okay? So that's what was on the table. They were getting evicted. They, they, they just, everything was just utter chaos and no new music was coming. But all of a sudden, somewhere in the middle of May, they came up with You're Crazy just, on, just because they weren't even trying to write a song. It just naturally happened. Uh, but that wasn't enough to, to you know, have Tom Zutat say, okay, let's go to the studio. But in the middle of August, um, or towards the end of August, they came up with Sweet Child of Mine and Mr. Brownstone in the same week. That was enough to say to Tom, okay, you guys are ready for pre-production. And, and um, you know, Al Alan was instrumental. I remember that's about when Alan came in because right when they were in pre-production, they also coincidentally ended up coming up with It's So Easy. And that's right when I first met Alan. That's right when he first came. I thought it, I thought it, you know, it's weird how my phone rang after I put it on silent. Um, anyways. Uh, hey, modern technology, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I flipped the red switch, it's silent, right? Yeah, it's still, it's still ringing. It's, it's still ringing. So but, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's when it all, that's when Alan stepped in and I remember seeing him for the first time at a rehearsal and he was trying to, you know, he immediately stepped in and was trying to send people on errands that you go here, you go get this, you get that. So he. Alan was kind of just got in there and started juggling the balls around. Yeah, and he did, he did a great job. Uh, just before I get into the whole uh, Guns N' Roses stuff, because I love Guns. Uh, since you were you, you grew up with Slash, there is that story where he was going to go join Poison or had auditioned to be Poison. He was going to be the CC DeVille before CC. Do you remember that time at all? And 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 how serious of a flirtation was it? It wasn't serious at all, but I'll tell you how that all went down. When Poison first moved here from Pennsylvania uh, to, to, you know, get their act going, you know, they had a couple gigs up there. They were doing well, but they knew they, they needed to go come to Los Angeles to, to you know, really get Not on. To make it happen. Yeah. And, well, now that's those days are gone. You can come to Los Angeles and find a desert out here. There's nothing you're not you're not going to make it anymore in Los Angeles. But. In those days, that was the time to do it. And um, they came out and the first gig they ever actually saw was at Madame Wong's West and it was Hollywood Rose. That was the first gig they saw. And right away, Matt Smith, who was the guitar player for, for Poison, recognized that Slash had what it needed. You know, Slash was the guy. I, although he wasn't looking to move out of Poison yet, but he, he, he knew that Slash had something. 
And then uh, what they, they started gigging, they, they had another gig that I guess Vicki Hamilton might have been managing them and they requested to have Hollywood Rose play with them. And so Hollywood Rose opened for them at the Troubadour, you know, a few months after that. And um, they were hanging out and, and I met Matt because I was an Aerosmith fan and so was Slash and so was Matt and Matt's Brody Paul. And, and we, you know, I had this huge Aerosmith collection. So I took them to my house and we hung out. And so we were all friends and nothing, you know, just like, hello, wait, hey, what's going on? Then what happened was Matt got his girlfriend pregnant, wanted to go home and start a family back to Pennsylvania and wanted Slash to replace him. But Slash wasn't really on board because he didn't want to shoot silly string in the air and say, hey, my name's Slash, because they all have a point where they, you know, it's kind of bubblegum rocket that, you know, all that silly string and everything. And, but Slash wasn't in a band right then. That was after Hollywood Rose broke up and there was really nothing going on. So I said, you know, you really should go, obviously you're gonna get the job uh, because you're good enough. And, you know, they want, the, the guitar player wants you to replace him. So, but he just didn't really wanna do it. I said, well, you know, they probably have a record deal coming up and, and it's just good stepping stone. You'll get in there, you'll make some noise and, you know, somebody will spot you and you'll, you'll be somewhere else. So, you know, I actually had to push him to do it. I actually drove him to see them at Radio City in, in Santa Ana, um, you know, on a Saturday night gig for that gig. And I was sick as a dog and I still drove them there. That's how badly I wanted him to, you know, I, my job was to get Slash to the next level. And the next level was to, you know, get him noticed, you know, cause I saw what, he, how good he was and how talented he was. And I wanted to him, you know, I wanted him to, 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 to you know, step out of Los Angeles and get into something and, and, you know, hit the ground running. But so that's what happened. But at the audition that I didn't even go with him to the audition, but uh, he kind of probably, you know, he did it. They, they, he, he, he learned the songs, he played it, but they could see that he didn't really want to join the band. And then CC walked in right after him and he, he knew that CC would get the job because CC had that look and, and obviously really wanted to join that band. So, and, and was a good fit for what they did. Slash really wouldn't have been a good fit. Uh, but on another I, note, I agree with you, by the way, a lot of people say, oh, you know, if Neil Peart was in Kiss and Matt, it's like, no, it, it doesn't work. You know, or if Eddie Van Halen was in Poison, no, it doesn't work. It, it, CC's pro right. You just, you're right about Eddie Van Halen, but Kiss, let me tell you something. There, I'm gonna tell you a story that Slash doesn't even remember. And this could have been a turning point regarding Kiss. 1982, uh, Ace Freely was out of Kiss, but nobody knew it unless right. you were inside the industry. And, uh, and I was a pretty big music fan and I didn't hear anything about it. But anyway, Slash was working two jobs, business card clocks for $6 an hour. And he was working at um, Hollywood Music Store, which was uh, where Genghis Cohen is now on uh, Melrose and Fairfax. Uh, anyways, the owner of that store, his name was Hiro, he's a Japanese guy. He could clearly see that in between no customers slash would plug a guitar into an amp and doodle around it. The, you know, it didn't take a genius to figure out that slash knew what he was doing. So he got word over to his contacts that when he knew that kiss was looking for a guitar player and actually recommended slash for the job. However, slash was 17 at the time. I was there when Paul Stanley called slash at business card clocks and I could hear Slash answering the questions and say, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I could pull that off. You know, the questions were, would you be able to record? Are you good enough to record? Can you tour? And, but and so everything was going good until he realized Slash was 17. He didn't really want to take a deeper look and have Slash learn a few songs and come down to the studio. But I bet you had Slash come to the studio, Slash had an image back then too. He wore moccasins, he just, he, he had the rock and roll image. As soon as he plug in that amp and they hear him play, it, the way he hits the notes, the way he learns the songs, they Slash would have been in Kiss. I guarantee it. And I don't know how long he would have stayed in Kiss because I don't know if they would have paid him properly. Um, and but he so, certainly would have been in Kiss, and he probably would have gotten noticed and maybe pulled out. Like you know, Steve Ray Vaughan was in David Bowie's band for five minutes and then you know went off on his own, but. Guns N' Roses might not have, you know, they, they had some, some Izzy and, and, and Axel were a good team and Duff certainly was good at what he was doing. And, but I don't know if they would have had, you know, without Slash, it, that, you know, I think you needed all five of those guys at that time. To, I agree. To that was definitely a team effort. Uh, you know, even if Izzy started a song, Slash would change it and, and, and put his two cents into it. And Duff would add something and, you know, Steven put the drums on there and it just, 
you know, even if you take Steven out and you try to listen to Rocket Queen without Steven or some, you know, a handful of those other songs, uh, you know, maybe you hear it, think about you with a different drummer, you wouldn't know the difference, but for most of those songs, there would be a difference. And so that, that's just, okay, so I put my book out, Reckless Road in 2000, almost 2008. I don't know if you have a copy. Do you have a copy? Um, do, I think I do actually, yes. Okay, so anyways, at the time we were putting that book together, we were talking about also doing a documentary. And, you know, the, uh, at that time, you know, Guns N' Roses going in a different direction, Slash and Axel weren't talking. Axel kind of wanted to bury that old Guns N' Roses and do something with the new band. And nobody was on the same page and there was no way we were gonna be able to do a proper documentary with the music and sync rights and everything that goes with it. However, we had the people, we had most of the people, you know, we had the roadies and the managers and, you know, uh, I, I didn't find Alan Niven at the time. I couldn't find his contact. Now, obviously I can contact him, but, you know, back then the internet wasn't as good as it is now. And, and you know, uh, you couldn't, you know, there's a few people like Rob Gardner, we couldn't find, he was the original uh, drummer with Tracy Guns and Ellie Guns, and he was the first drummer in Guns N' Roses, couldn't find him. After we got the book out, we found him. So now we could catch up. But during the pandemic, everyone's zooming back and forth. And even on the news, there, there's no guests in their studio. Everything's, you know, the world's gotten used to the Zoom thing. And Jason Porath, who was my co-author for Reckless Road and pretty much made that book happen, um, he started thinking, you know, he, he, during the pandemic, he's working from home or not working. And he's thinking, wow, this would be a good time to catch up on that documentary. And now we found a few more people that weren't involved the first time around. And we have some, you know, the videos that we recorded, uh, the interviews that we did with Robert John, who was a photographer, uh, you know, Slash, Duff, Steven, uh, who did we get? We got Tom Zutat, we got Mike Klink, we got Vicki Hamilton, we got a bunch of people on video. Some people we got on audio because we didn't have the budget to fly them here from where they were. Um, like, you know, my Michelle Young and, you know, different roadies or people that were in the previous bands that now moved away. Uh, so, we have that stuff so we could intertwine it. So it started out, we, we did a few experimentals with it. We did, you know, episode one, like four different times and they're completely different. They just changed every time. So now when people say, oh, I saw episode one, it was really good. I don't even know which one is episode one anymore. That's how many episode ones I've seen, but they're all good because they're you're getting information that no, that most people don't know. And even if some of it's in the book, it doesn't mean everyone has seen the book. And it's, I think it's more powerful when you see the person saying it themselves rather than just reading it in a book. And there's visuals, you know, with a podcast, you have audio, you know, I recorded all those songs. Uh, every show that Guns ever played in Los Angeles, maybe with the exception of one that I missed, I recorded them. So the first, okay, there's 12 songs on Appetite for Destruction. I was there for 10 of them the first time they were played. Um, so that let me let me just ask you about that you recorded all all the shows like just on on a sort of you know cassette walkman thing and they sound like horrible or did you get like soundboard and you have like uh, real walkman and they don't sound horrible some of them are good because i was smart i put a little microphone in, gotcha. you know, and i brought the core i had that like in my pocket because i've also taken pictures and i brought the microphone out and put it on my watch and i was careful not to you know make too much noises with that uh, a couple shows you know, were a little muddy, but uh, a lot of the shows are actually very clean. There was some board tapes that I, I did. I was smart enough to get once I figured out how to talk to deal with the sound man and, you know, you know, <laughs> slip him 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah, you know what the problem with those board tapes are uh, the vocals are way too loud and, and uh, everything because the, you know, the vocals were the, the axles going through the board mostly and the band was so loud that they didn't need the board. So you're getting an echo. You're getting an echo through the amps into the microphone and axle. So it's, it's, it, it was, yes, it's true. I used to be so OCD that I would take the board tape and take the, the one I made and get, I try to sync them together, one in the right channel, one in the left channel. And I had one of those tape players that you could slow and speed down the, 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 the speed. And uh, when you start to hear, hear the echo, because you know they're all little different speeds, if you try to play them at the same time, one would start to go a little faster than the other. And you'd start to hear like an echo. And then when that echo came, I'd try to speed it up or slow it down. And, you know, I did all that and just to have some fun with it. But 
in the end, honestly, the raw, the, the raw material sounds great. I, I, you know, when, when the first time they played Welcome Jungle was July 20th at the Troubadour. That was the first time I even heard it. I didn't even hear it at a rehearsal. It was just brand new and they, they just knocked it out. And I was like, wow, you know, I knew they were a great band. I knew they were a good fit. Some of those musicians went, you know, intertwined in Hollywood Rose back and forth and didn't work that time because Steven still had double bass drums and Izzy exited as soon as Slash entered. And uh, you just didn't have, yeah, you had Axel Slash and Steven, but it wasn't, it, you know, it lasted three months. You could barely hear Axel. Songwriting was okay. Uh, you know, it just needed something else to it. I guess a little bit of magic from Izzy and Duff. And, uh, you know, and one of Steven's bass drums to disappear. And when Slash joined Guns N' Roses, he was in Black Sheep, actually. Another band I made him join. It was a heavy metal band. I'm sure you know who they were. Yep. Um, anyways, you probably knew Willie Bass, but... Yes, uh, he passed away uh, last yeah. year, I believe, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it was actually a couple years ago, but... Yeah, um, Willie was a great guy. We got yeah. along... Him and I got along great. Slash was in the band just for one song. He had just joined and he learned the songs. It wasn't really what he does, but he pulled it off well. And... Uh, the first gig they did was Slash was at the Country Club May 31st, 85. And uh, that's exactly when Tracy and Rob Gardner walked from, from GNR and they had a gig booked in, at the Troubadour the next week and they had a gig, they had some gigs up north uh, in Seattle and, you know, Oregon. And, you know, they came and they said, all right, so we know Slash already. You've worked in Hollywood Rose. Every, okay, it's all good. We need you, you know. And, and we need Steven too because Rob left and so Stephen and and, Ra, and 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 Slash joined, and you know they they had like a couple rehearsals, and they played that show at the Troubadour. But what, what was all different for me at that gig was they were so photogenic. I shot four rolls of film in just thirty five minutes, and I didn't have an automatic winder. I had to take a picture and go click. You know the old school. <laughs> the good old school. And then refocus uh -huh. and all that. But that's how good. No matter where I pointed the camera, it, it's a shot. I've shot Iron Maiden. I've shot, you know, Jews. I've shot hundreds of bands. Yeah. Prince you shot. I, I've seen, I saw your stuff. Your, your stuff's great, by the way. I don't, thank you. I don't know about hundreds of bands, but I shot a lot of bands. And a lot of times you pull the camera and there's nothing. You just don't pull the trigger. You look at it and you don't like what you see. You just, you wait for another moment. With that gig, it didn't matter who I pointed the camera at. It was, there was a, a photo to be taken. And you know, I noticed that the music slowed down. There was only one bass drum, and and it, you could hear Axel clean. And you know, I heard "Don't Cry" that night, which I had never heard that Izzy and Axel put that together before Slash joined. I already knew, uh, you know, some of the other songs. Um, Think about you. Actually, I heard that night for the first time. But I, I knew like "Anything Goes" and and you know, "Reckless" and "Shadow Your Love." But uh, anyway, so that just like was like that gig opened my eyes like. Hey, I think they got it this time. And they did debut. Uh, no, no, they didn't debut that. That was the next gig that I saw. They debuted Mama Kim, but it wasn't really their song anyways. But, you know, when they put together Jungle, that was like, wow, yes, Don't Cry was pretty powerful. And I, and, and that showed you that they have the potential of, of at least being on the radio or whatever. You could see that that was a hit. But when Welcome to the Jungle came out, I recorded that night. I, after the show, I listened to it in my car. I'm like, wow. Because, you know, you don't really know what you heard the first time you hear it, and it's live. But hearing it in the car for the next couple of days, like, oh, wow, that, that, that's, I mean, it sounds just like the album. I mean, this guitar solo is the same, everything. Right. You know, two months later, they came up with Rocket Queen, and that sounds just like the record. And, you know, Axel gets out there and says, this is a new one. We, uh, it's not much, but it's the best. It ain't much, but it's the best I could do. This song's for Barbie. This song's <laughs> called Rocket Queen. And, and, you know, Barbie was a good friend of his and actually the tattoo on his arm is supposedly half supposed to be Barbie and half some Monique or some, some girl that Axel dated. Let me just ask you one thing, because were you just sort of following Guns N' Roses at that time or were you on the Sunset Strip going to all the different shows and all the different bands? No, I was following Slash. My, okay, okay. Slash, because Slash, Slash, you know, we were good friends in the fifth grade. And, and, you know, I noticed right away his artwork. He had dinosaurs and snakes and a jungle. And, and you know, and he was writing, he was doing this without tracing it out of a book. It was just coming out of his head, you know. So, you know, he had some talent. It was, and we were hanging out and whatever. And we, you know, we lived a block away from each other. We were card pulling to school. 
at some point we started writing BMX and we weren't listening to music yet. And, and he was faster and, and better than anyone else. He'd fly off the jump and people would be taking camp, you know, the flashes would be going off when he flew over the jump. Not anyone else, but him, because he was doing X games type of things, you know, full tabletops and, you know, all these weird little things. And he just had, you know, something special about him. And I was documenting that. I was taking pictures of him jumping over Park La Brea, Tar La Brea Tarpets, flying off that ski jump that used to be there. But I'd lay under them and, you know, it looked like he's flying in the air and bunny hopping trash cans. Just, you know, we caused trouble as kids. Then we lost touch for about a year because he got kicked out of John Burroughs Junior High School, uh, probably for absenteeism or tardiness or smoking cigarettes or whatever. But uh, he went to Bancroft, so we lost touch for about a year. And uh, just just be, uh, by default, because we weren't in the same school, no one had cell phones yet. Uh, but at the summer school, the like 10th grade, uh, we bumped into each other. His mom put him in Beverly Hills High Summer School for that, uh, you know, that summer. And, and we just literally bumped into each other. I'm wearing an Aerosmith shirt, he's wearing a Zeppelin shirt. So like I said, we weren't listening to music when we were hanging out. So naturally we both got into music and we both liked the same bands. And he said, oh yeah, I've been playing guitar for about six months. I'm this band called Titus Sloan. Right then and there, I knew that this is gonna be good. And I went with him that day. My mom came to pick me up and now I'm going with him. I went with him to, to a garage. Adam Greenberg was the drummer. And I, I knew Adam Greenberg from John Burroughs. And uh, right away, he, it was what, just what I thought. He, he had this uh, BC Rich Mockingbird plugged it into a Sun Amp. They were playing Heaven and Hell. It was so heavy. You would, I mean, Tony Iommi would have been like, wow. And, but then, you know, and that impressed me that he can get such a thick, rich sound and he could get controlled feedback and all that stuff. But when they were playing some originals and he went into a guitar solo or even some blues jams and he was improvising, right away I was getting goosebumps saying, okay, so he's only been playing six months. So he's not technically like, you know, can do all this stuff, but what he is doing, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's powerful. And so I instantly start, started helping him you know, get to the next level, whatever he needed, a new pack of guitar strings, go to Santa Ana to look at an amp or, you know, buy a guitar from the recycler, just whatever, you know, just help him get the equipment that he needs, whether it's an effect pedal, uh, you know, a, a ride somewhere, just whatever, just, I was fully promoting him and tell it all my friends, you gotta come, they got a party on this date and, you know, just trying to get a crowd there. And when he finally eventually, you know, ended up in the Appetite for Destruction lineup, it wasn't just him, it was, I knew Axel had it. Um, I didn't know about the rest of them. And then when I saw what they were doing, putting these songs together, Paradise City, My Michelle, you know. It's great I, songs. Let me I, ask you just real real quick, because you, you, you touched real quick on Hollywood Rose and, and LA Guns and stuff. Tracy Guns is a fantastic guitar player. We, we know that. He, he can play circles around people. Why didn't it work with Axel? Where, where did it just not connect? Was it personality? Was it just they didn't have the songs? Because well, it's he's a great that, player. It's funny that you say personality because, okay, so Slash and, and, and Tracy were in rival bands. And Tracy had been playing for years before Slash had been started. So, you know, Tracy was playing playing Led Zeppelin covers and was just, you know, he was doing it, you know, and he had all this nice equipment and a nice guitar. And so I remember going to a party with Slash and, and Pyrus was Tracy's Guns' first band. They were playing that party and I was like, wow, look at this guy. This guy is pulling it off. And yeah, 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 I know him. But so anyways, when Hollywood Rose fell apart, Axel immediately joined up with, with Tracy. And that was like, uh, that was the rival, Slash's rival. And, and uh, you know, what I, he only lasted two gigs with that. So it fell apart in two, after two gigs. And those gigs, by the way, were a week apart. So Axel might have only been in the band like two weeks, maybe three weeks, or at least that I know of. And so Hollywood Rose kind of, you know, fell apart when Slash, when, when that fell apart. So what happened was Ace, uh, Tracy and Axel kind of hooked up again towards the end of that year, towards the end of, of 84. And Tracy didn't want to join Rose or Hollywood Rose because then Axel would have been the man in charge. And Axel didn't want to join Tracy's band, you know, LA Guns, because then Tracy's the God. 
and and we already went through that and it's not going to work so it was two personalities that that were banging heads but they decided how about this how about we start a third band and it will be a side project it won't be any one of our bands it'll just be both of our bands and we'll both kind of you know be equals in it so that's how guns and roses got started it was a side project and uh you know izzy was back in the in the picture and, and you know they had rob already was there and they picked up a bass player, Uli, that was, you know, what was in LA Guns. And he didn't, he only, he didn't even make it to one gig. He quit the band pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, then they ended up with that. But you're, back to your question. Uh, we don't have a real reason and Tracy keeps ghosting us. But, but the funny thing is he ghosted me for Reckless Road. I mean, I had a cell number. Hi, this is Tracy, leave a message. I left a message as he never called me back. This was in 2007. Then I bumped into him at a memorial service for a mutual friend and he apologized. Hey, I didn't realize you were really putting a nice, you know, this really great project together. It's the history. It, it, it tells him what it is. It's not anyone's opinion. It's just a bunch of facts right there for you. It's a, it's a scrapbook of facts. And so um, if you ever need me again, let me know, you know, and I'll be there. Well, now we're doing this podcast. We never got Tracy's input and, and he, didn't reply, you know, he didn't come back on it. But I, I think he might not like the ending of where where that got because if you ask Axel, you're gonna get one opinion. So you can't really, you can't just because Axel says this or Izzy says that, it doesn't mean that's what happened. Tracy has a side of the story too. So you're never gonna get the story out until you hear it from all of them and then you can make your own decisions. But from what I got is they really didn't want to go up north to that tour. They didn't, it didn't sound very stable to them. How, you know, the car wasn't that good. And they were right, the car did break down and they had a hitchhike. And, you know, it just, also there, there might've been, might have been, I'm not gonna say it in stone, but there might've been some argument between Axel and Tracy at the last gig before that at Dancing Waters uh, uh, regarding how a song, the arrangement of a song that they were playing or something they want, either one of them wanted to change and the other one disagreed, that's, what I've gotten into it, but I'm sure Tracy doesn't have too much remorse because uh, had he not left the band, yeah, they, they would have been a good band, but they wouldn't have had that appetite for destruction lineup. You wouldn't have Welcome to the Jungle, which was Slash's input. You wouldn't have had Paradise City. You wouldn't have had Rocket Queen. You wouldn't, there's so many songs you wouldn't have. It might not have been enough to get that band off the ground. And even though it would have been good, you know, they did have Don't Cry, they did have, they did have, they certainly, certainly could put songs together. I remember seeing Izzy and, and Tracy around that time coming into Canners, because Tracy used to live a block away from Canners on Orange Grove, I believe. And um, they would sit at the counter for hours writing, writing lyrics and, you know, working on melodies. And so sure that they would have produced songs, but I don't, there's, you know, the it wouldn't have been the same magic. I mean, you know, a lot of people always say you need the reunion, you need this. You, it really is about the magic, and and those those five guys created the magic. And 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 I can't see Axl Rose singing "Sex Action," quite frankly. <laughs> oh, no, but you know, here's the other thing about it. It was what, that magic also came from because how they were living. They were writing about what was going on. Right. Hiding from the cops, uh, you know, uh, four of them are living in a shoebox that's not even, it's a studio for rehearsing, not for living. You know, there's no bathroom there. They have to go to the alley to pee, uh, you know, or go to Denny's to use the bathroom or something that was right behind Denny's. But you got that, you know, Duff was living with a girlfriend, but the rest of them, you know, if they had, if they struck out at night with whoever they were trying to sleep, you know, spend the night at someone's house, you know, they, they, they slept in the studio there. So when one of them picks up a guitar and starts to, you know, work on something, the other guys are there to hear it. So, you know, it, the music is, 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 a, is a true collabor collaboration. Later, I'm not knocking it what happened later. I'm just saying later, use your illusion, things change because now they are all living separately. They all have little mini studios in their house. And so Izzy will record a song in full before anyone even heard it and got to rip it apart or change something or change a rip and then submit it to the band and then they work on it. So things got put together in a different fashion. And what are they gonna write about now? The record company ripping them off, uh, you know, there's, or, or their lawyer screwing them or something, but it, it, it's, so things are gonna change. I'm not saying they lost their talent, not at all. It's just, 
it's a different set of circumstances. Well, let me ask you this, because you're bringing up an interesting point, uh, and I want to bring it quickly to 2021. They, they reunited in 2016. They've done five years. The other day in Boston, they, they debuted this song, Absurd, which was Silkworms from 2001. Why do you think it's taken them so long to put out a new album? Is it just they, they can't get it legally? They're, they're just in, in their own little planets, like you're saying, and they, 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 they have their own studios and it's a different reality because five years, 10 songs. It doesn't sound like hard work. I'm not an expert in, in, in what's going on. But, but I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I know things that happened in 85, 86 and before that. I know things that happened after that. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it pretty much falls apart for me around 2007-ish. But um, so, you know, for me, there's a lot of emotions with that, with, with what they do. And, and it's, uh, it's just, I, I don't really want to get into it, but I, I can't, you know, I, I can't uh, comment on that because it, it's not, it's not a fair comment because it's just an opinion. And, and, and my opinion doesn't mean it's right. And, and I won't, I, I like to try to stay to, stay to the facts that I know. And, and, you know, I, I kind of stay out of that. That's run by, you know, a machine basically. And, and, you know, so I, I can't get involved in, in, in why this, why that. It could be a, a number of factors in there. Um, right. I could say I was really proud when I found out Axel was up there, you know, singing with ACDC, that he pulled that off. You know, the you that, know, you know, that was to... great, by the way. I'm sorry, but I know, and I've got my ACDC font in the back, and people have been bitching and moaning about Axel and ACDC. I want a live album and DVD from that tour because he was fucking fantastic. And I'm saying he was fucking fantastic. We knew he did the Bon Scott stuff. He already proved that. And we knew that that's, you know, when you first, I first time at, I heard Axel sing, I said, it's, it's Bon Scott married to Janis Joplin. You know, it, it was that, he, he, well, that was one of his ranges. Axel would make some specials. He has like five, six ranges, but you know, the It's So Easy voice is one of my favorites too. So it was a whole lot of rosy when they used to, when they used to cover that. Yeah, a whole lot of Rosie. So anyways, you knew he could do that, but I was actually afraid he was going to hurt himself doing the Brian Johnson stuff. And he pulled it off. He certainly pulled it off. But well, he agreed. I watched some of that on YouTube and I was cringing. Even though he was doing, I wasn't cringing because it was bad. I was cringing because it was good. And But I was afraid he was going to hurt himself because Axel is the type of person, the Axel I know, is the type of person that's going to give it 150%. You know, it's like victory or death. So he's gonna hit that note even if he shouldn't hit that note you hear what i'm saying so that <laughs> that that i was really proud that that he took that you know that he if i and if we go back to 1984 when his goal was he was working at you know tower video and believe it or not he set a bar you know what his bar was that no matter where i sleep i don't care as long as i can get a gym membership so i can have a place to shower because, you know, if he'd sleep on someone's couch or he'd sleep, he'd find a girl, hook up with a girl, sleep there. Sometimes he'd strike out and he'd sleep at the stairwell of, of that uh, tower video right behind. There's like a little corner in there. And uh, so he said, I don't care where I sleep as long as they have a place to shower. So if I can go back to 1984 and say, guess what? Just as he's telling me that one day you are going to fill in for Brian Johnson. <laughs> he would think I'm crazy, you know? <laughs> and on top of that, your own band is going to be bigger than ACDC. And, and so, you know, or as big or whatever, one of those bands that in 300 years from now, they're gonna still be relevant. You know, kids are gonna turn 14 and buy that appetite for destruction. How, how they buy it, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know what the technology will be, but I guarantee you when, a, when during a baseball game and the closing pitcher comes out, someone's gonna be playing Welcome at the Jungle. Yeah, listen, they're, they're, they are the new Beethoven in a sense. They, they are like a Mozart and a Beethoven where 350 years later, we're still listening to Symphony Number no. 5 and Welcome to the Jungle. It's just, it, it is, that's what's gonna happen. It's a tattoo that it's for life <laughs> right up there with the stones and the Beatles and Zeppelin and Aerosmith. you know there, there's there's a good amount of bands there's probably 20 bands that will stand the test of time when I say that even in a thousand years from now but uh yeah so that that's basically you know that's basically you know what I what my job is to 
is to get this information out that people don't know. I, I know this because I'm an Aerosmith fan and I was a huge Aerosmith collector. And I would kill to get some of this information, how they got to that first lineup, what, you know, what they, when they debuted this song or that song and, you know, stories that got lost on the cutting room floor, just, you know, and, and I don't know everything. I know a lot that I saw, but some of these other people, we got Chris Weber, and even though we, he participated in the book, we got him a lot better, and a lot cleaner, because it was a different project. We just needed him to comment a couple things for the book, which he did, and there's a few quotes. But on the podcast, you almost get a tear in your eye because it's so powerful. And same with Rob Gardner, although we didn't have him the first time, very powerful. So, and Adam Greenberg talks about how the drummer from Titus Sloan, the Slash's first band, he, he tells you, he lays it down exactly how that came together, how it was working with Slash, no, recognizing that Slash was on a different level and they were way behind and they knew that he was gonna fly away at some point. But just getting that, it just makes it such an emotional documentary that it's, it's just moving, it really is moving. Really is. And let me just quickly remind the folks that the video podcast is called The First 50 Gigs, Guns N' Roses and the Making of Appetite for Destruction. Season one, which is good news because that means there's probably going to be a season two, uh, launches August 19th, 19th, I should say, uh, through Patreon, which is going to be very cool. Yeah, That's, there's, uh, there's also an exhibit that they're doing at the Roosevelt Hotel, which is cool because we used to go there for the Capitol Records swap meet back in the 80s. Uh, it was at that hotel. And actually, another point is Duff married his first wife, Mandy, at that hotel. So there, there's another that, another thing there. But um, in, anyways, that yeah, that, that's going to be like a gallery of some images from the book or, you know, from, from what I captured him. And also Jack Lou, who is, um, he, I don't know if he's been on your show, but he, he uh, he's very relevant in today's world. He photographs every single band he can. And he works with uh, that, uh, high, what's that, Days, Days Magazine, high, high uh, can't think of the name of it. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's like a heavy metal magazine that in Los Angeles, High Wire Days or something. Something like that. Uh, I'm, here, I'm just going to look at it. The, uh, the first 50 gigs, uh, the exhibit is uh, August 18th at 6 p.m. at Roosevelt Hotel. And, uh, oh, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the, uh, the, the well, there is a ticketing link, but uh, anyway, you can just sort of search that up. But uh, Mark, this has been great, by the way. I, I never knew about Slash and Kiss. I knew about Richie Sambora in 82. I knew about Doug Aldridge in 82, all going for that Kiss gig. Did not know about Slash. Because he didn't make it. He didn't make it to the interview. He, he didn't get past the phone interview. And I'll tell you something funny. You know, Slash has had a lot of alcohol in his brain and other things. And so, yeah, he remembers, like if you read his book, he remembers a lot of things, but he has them mixed up a little bit sometimes. And the stories are half right and half, it's two stories into one or, or the dates are wrong. But it's, you know, it's, it's someone once said, it doesn't matter, it's how they remember it. So you got to go with it. But we were once doing an interview with Niels, Niels Oslauer, you know, the photographer, and he was doing some kind of YouTube channel, but for some reason, this one never made it on because the, the project ended after, right after we recorded it. But I told this story and Slash looked at me really confused. And he was like, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> I said, at all? That was kind of a big deal that you had a, 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 a chance to maybe be in Kiss. But it was so, it was such a brief moment in time. It's like, it happened so quick that, you know, okay, uh, Paul Stanley's gonna call you today at two o'clock. Okay, two o'clock came that day and Paul Stanley called and then we never heard from him again. So it was like, it wasn't like something that was building up and he had to rehearse for it. It just, it just like happened. But it, it, <laughs> It, it, it is a story and it, it is out there. So I'm just imagining what Creatures of the Night with Eric Carr and Slash would have sounded like. I mean, that is, damn, that would have been good. Not that, I, not that we don't like Vinny, but Slash. No, I, I know, <laughs> I know, but certain things aren't meant to be. But I know. Another, thing, another thing about Guns N' Roses is, you know, I knew they had the vocal range. I knew they had the song ready. I knew they had the guitar playing and the sound. And they knew they had the image because... A lot of bands don't have that. You, I remember as a kid going to Westwood and coming home with like a, a Zeppelin poster or an Aerosmith poster or something. You and Michael Schenker with a Flying V poster, and you hang these all over your wall. But who, what band is there today that you'd want to get their poster and put it on your wall? And uh, I'm not, I'm, BTS. 
I'm not <laughs> saying there wouldn't be any good bands anymore. Like Muse, take for example, Muse is a great band. I went to see them live and I fell asleep. There's no, there was no stage presence. There was no image. There was and the music's good, but there's, you know, Guns and Roses was the last of those bands that you could identify every member in the band and know exactly who's who. And and there was there was a stage presence. There's something there, and. Yes, I, I saw the stage presence at that first show. Slash always had the stage presence, but for the rest of them. But what really kind of clicked it, there was two shows after that that really set my mind, you know, to, to lift the bar even higher. They played the street scene September 28th of 85, Los Angeles downtown street scene. And Slash had just got a Les Paul three days before that. And so that was the finishing touch to the, you know, to Slash's and the Les Paul image. But they got up there at 8.30 at night and, and they were supposed to play at 5.30 because the whole day was running late. Social Distortion was playing after them and people knew who they were. Nobody really knew who GNR was. They, before that, they played in front of maybe 200 people. And so maybe there was four, 20, 30 people there that knew who GNR was. Those people were not happy to see GNR take that stage when, when they're ready, their band they're waiting for is already three hours late. Also, and they're throwing, they're throwing beer, they're spitting at the band, they're shaking the stage, they're throwing pieces of hamburgers. And Guns N' Roses is just there, you know, just, just pushing harder. And by the second song, the crowd was eating out of their hands. And they, they maintained that stage and they, 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 they just, they, they owned it, you know? And I'm taking pictures from behind the, the drum the drum riser looking out to the crowd saying, wow, this looks like, you know, Woodstock as far as I'm concerned, because there's the, the people just keep going back. You know, it might've only been 2000, but it looked like a lot. And, it, you know, I just, it was crazy. And I, and, and I shot off like four rolls of film in that 20 minute set. That's how, that's how good it was. It just was just great. So much energy. Yep. That's what made me realize they are not only a great band, but they are a stadium band. Even though that's not a stadium, I saw that that they could they could grab that whole crowd, not just the crowd that came to see them, but they could grab the people that had no idea who they were and and pull them in. And I saw it again when they opened for Ted Nugent in Black and Blue at, at the at Santa Monica Civic after they got signed. Still, nobody in that crowd. I should say nobody. There's four thousand people there, probably. 300 of them knew who GNR was, 400 of them. And you know what? They blew Ted off the stage and, and, and that the whole crowd was cheering for them after every song. It sounded like, you know, like a live concert where you hear, you know, where the band stops and you hear all the audience, you know, cheering. It wasn't just a couple claps. I mean, so they also, and that was a big stage. That was the first time they were on a big stage and they, 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 they used every inch of that stage. They, they, you know, they, they made it work. And it, they, it's amazing that you, you, you just know, because, uh, and I'll tell a couple of things. Uh, when I first saw Guns N' Roses open for Aerosmith in Saratoga Springs, I've seen a bunch of openers before and you just went, eh. but you saw Guns and you just went, yep, that band's going to be something. And, and, and I felt the same way. Listen, a couple of years after I saw Black, uh, the Black Crows open, I guess, for Aerosmith again. And you just went, yep. <laughs> you know I, I know when when guns first got out of los angeles they went on tour at the colt obviously the colt was you know touring uh arenas and nobody really knew who guns and roses were but after tom zoot had told me that every city that they played in the next day there would be a spike in sales people would go out and buy appetite for destruction from those record stores in that city and same happened with motley crew and, and alice cooper and then you know then you know, Welcome to the Jungle wouldn't get played on the radio because the radio station, uh, MTV, I'm sorry, not the radio. Well, yeah, radio too, but other than KNEC or those heavy metal underground stations, MTV refused to play Welcome to the Jungle video and they didn't want to lose sponsors because they thought Guns N' Roses was associated with, you know, raping girls and that, you know, because of the album cover and, you know, what just drugs and whatever. And I, I will say the that original album cover was in bad taste. I mean, respectfully. <laughs> A joke. Axel used to go to Tower Video and Tower Records, and you know they had these kind of weird postcards that there, and he'd come home with like two or three of those postcards, and he just loved those little fun little, you know, little things. And he was joking. He said, "Here, here's our, uh, here, there's our album cover." And he was joking, and the other guys said, "Totally." And you know, I don't know how they got that approved, 
but I remember I was sitting in Tom Zutet's office after the record came out, like, I don't know, a few months later, working on something with him. And um, he showed me the new cover. And he said, yeah, that got banned. This is going to be the new cover. I went to Aaron's records on Melrose and bought all of them. <laughs> I bought, there was like 14 of them there because it was, you know, at, Guns N' Roses was known in Los Angeles. So they, Aaron Records stocked a bunch of them. I just grabbed them all, brought them to the front desk, and they were $5.99 and bought them all because I knew that it's a collector's item one day. And still people come to me for them every now and then. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's just, there's a lot. Um, there's a, there's a lot, I mean, when MTV, Tom Zutat got MTV to, to play Welcome to the Jungle, and they only agreed to play it once at like, you know, three in the morning, uh, our time, uh, I'm sorry, three, yeah, three in, the, three in the morning, our time, and maybe, or two in the morning, our time, five o'clock in the morning, New York time, and their switchboard blew up, play that again, play that again, so they had no choice but to throw it in rotation, and by that point, they probably had sold 200,000 records, and it's been a year, you know, almost a year, and uh, that, ju that jung jungle hit the air airwaves. And, you know, it wasn't soon after that. Maybe it might have taken Sweet Child to come out also, but they were selling 200,000 records a week after that. And so, it, you know, then I, I was like, all right, it's, you know, they're, they're out there, you know, they're out there. They're, that's it. They're, they're, you know, they're, and you could tell. It's it's amazing how you can tell. Uh, on that, I've got to get going because it's actually my daughter's 18th birthday and we have a dinner starting in less than half an hour. But uh, Mark, a great pleasure. Let's do a part two at some point. I'll, I'll get Alan on and we'll trade stories. Uh, right. The first 50 gigs, Guns N' Roses and the making of Appetite for Destruction, a visual podcast starts on the Patreon on August 19th. And on that, as we say in Montreal, merci. That was fascinating. Love it. Yeah, you could also go to first50gigs.com to get some information on that and, and find those links, you know, that you need to go to. Now, is that my dog or your dog? My dog. <laughs> You're lucky. It's the old first time you barked. <laughs> well, and mine was barking before, but there you go. Thank you, sir. All right. See you later. Cheers. All right. Great.